Welcome to Serial Bookworms, where we are reading through Mother of Learning a few chapters at a time and talking about them every other week. Feel free to participate, speculate, and ask questions. All I ask is that please keep to the keep the topic to the current knowledge and chapters if you have read ahead or have already read the entire story. So far, we have looped 24 months. Happy loop anniversary, Zorian! We get into things with Zorian waking up annoyed that he was blindsided with his most recent death. He spends much of the time heading to the academy trying to design a practice dummy, something he could make out of soil and scraps, but it would need strong defenses so he wouldn't be obliterated by any spell he sends at it, so, and probably a repair function to cut down on maintenance from any like micro fractures. Uh, uh, mm. Zorian working on a project kind of sounds like uh, me whenever I think of a new like redeem to add. Scope creep is real. If you or anyone you know designing systems suffers from scope creep, please get them assistance before they're trapped in a never ending spiral of whiteboarding. He's still not taking any time to rest, beelining to the sewers to contact the RNA and matriarch with the memory packet she gave him. Along the way, he Pulps a cephalatic rat that tried to mind probe him, unable to use the rat to reach back to the greater collective of the psychic rats. His day one speedrun comes to a close as he wonders who could teach him dangerous combat spells that no other instructor at the academy would rightly provide to a freshly certified mageling. Oh, right. Hyben. This cycle, rather than just accepting the sewer quest blithely, he leverages it to bargain some lessons out of Tyven. It's a pretty sweet deal, since she only needs to teach him for the next month. Uh, to be fair, a month is a bit of a hard limit for Zorian's bargaining, kind of outside his control to extend, uh, relatively at least. Subjectively, time is a lie and is about as real as birds, <laughs> am I right? Though he's still not wanting to waste his time, and proposes talking to his spider friends for the pocket watch the quest giver is wanting. Ivan seems pretty okay with this reveal. Seems when she isn't ambushed and surprised by a bunch of telekinetic spiders, uh, she's much more okay with Zorian being friends with them. Ivan is skeptical of teaching Zorian any spells, though, especially any more powerful than a flamethrower like he requests. You know, you know, the Zorian's kind of asking for something with uh, a stopping power against, oh, I don't know, trolls as a non-specific purely theoretical defensive measure. A short demonstration by Zorian of his skills by pulling soil from the ground and compressing it into a sphere before irating off like a dart at a target is enough to assuage Tyven that he does have the shaping skills. And she grudgingly begins to think of options to teach him. Over the next few days, Zorian gets his adventure spell list staples filled out in between general combat training with Tyven. She teaches him some of the stuff you might be familiar with if you've played any fantasy RPG game or a tabletop pen and paper. You know, he's got your spider climb, your feather fall, spells to mitigate extreme temperatures, etc, etc. You know, your survivalist staples. Amidst all of this, Zorian wonders if there is a way to speed up growth of his mana reserves. We learn that technically it's possible through heavy spell casting to mana exhaustion consistently. The problem with this is that it wrecks your shaping skills. 
there's a balance between mana capacity and finesse. The higher a mage's magnitude, the more difficult to find spellcasting is. With most spells being for magnitude 8 to 12, where Zorian's natural capacity rests in the low end of, he'll have no issues. Zorian, though, does bring up a hypothetical magnitude 60 person. The capacity Zorian once roughly calculated Zack to possibly be at. Apparently, such a person would take years, maybe even a decade, to gain even the basic amount of proficiency in spellcasting, which does seem to fit Zack's profile, as he struggled mightily until the time loop, which has given him ample time to catch up. There's also the poisoned pill that is ambient mana, whose absorption can be used for a quick boost, but is toxic for prolonged or frequent use. Mages have been known to become incredibly ill or suffer from permanent mental afflictions. Later, Zorian, Tyven, and co. head into the sewers and have a chat with the Aranea. Describing the man and the pocket watch, the matriarch realizes she recognizes who it is. A person who is not simply a clumsy adventurer. He's actually part of the invasion, and the watch does more than keep time. Speaking to Zorian privately through a mind bridge while speaking out the other side of her mandibles? He didn't really even be speaking out the other side of her mandibles if she's using a sound illusion to project speaking to the party publicly while also simultaneously speaking with her mind. You know what? I think we're getting lost in the webs here. Roll that back. Let's continue on. <laughs> Spear of Resolve instructs Zorian to gather some information about the person who gave them the quest and try to shake hands with them so they can use these variety of tidbits to divine and track down the person once he goes home or perhaps makes contact with the invaders elsewhere. While waiting for the watch to be fetched, Hyven is curious as to why the spiders would be attacked, as they seem quite pleasant. Amidst their dialogue, our list of sapient beings gets a couple additions and mentions of dragons, lizard persons, and various monster clans forming pacts and trading with nations tacked on. Seems this world has a little bit more than just humanoid and spideroid. No, arachnid would probably be a better term, creatures. But the Aranea in particular have had a long and beneficial relationship with the humans in Sayoria. Deals with the humans who first settled there helped advance Aranean magic to new heights, and then those spiders eventually left the web to establish their own, spreading knowledge throughout the continent. On the way to deliver the watch, Zorian whiles away the time trying to figure out how to use the magic pocket watch to no avail until he applies the object divinations he had been learning from Hasluch. Unfortunately, it is an incomprehensible interface of dials and sigils. There's always the next restart to snag and disassemble this pocket watch. Returning to the matriarch later so she can divine and track down the quest giver, we get confirmation that the invaders are from the Ilquan Ivasa. The reason for the invasion is a bit mixed. That's one part a bit of revenge for being exiled, but another part thinking Eldamar has been weakened after the Splinter Wars and Weeping wiped out so many battle mages. However, the invasion isn't a conquering one. Couldn't have been, factoring in the time loop, as there's been groundwork and other attacks in the 
dungeon area leading up to the big attack during the summer festival. But the planetary alignment is important as part of the attack. In addition to the demons the invasion wants to unleash, which we've learned haven't made an appearance for the same reason angels seem to be cut off in the time loop, they want to summon a primordial. In addition to being a pretty neat word, we get a wham line to drive home exactly how dangerous a primordial is. Zorian goes white. It describes such an event would leave a lifeless crater where Sayoria used to be. Ooh, these primordials sound like a very big deal. Apparently, the summoning is being done by the uh, esoteric order of the Celestial Dragon, uh, also known as the Cult of the World Dragon. Ah, jeez. Now ain't that a puffed up pompous name for an organization like I ain't ever done seen before. <laughs> the worst part is due to both of those things, the demon and the primordial summoning being outside the loop, Zorian and the Aranea can't really work on countermeasures to it happening. Zorian is introduced to his new mind magic teacher, enthusiastic seeker of novelty. Seems the little hyper spider speaking a mile a minute will be helping him now that he knows enough that a master telepath like Spear of Resolve doesn't need to be around to guide him. Zorian asks the matriarch if novelty has an off switch, to which the matriarch simply projects feelings of amusement at him. We get a just great summary of Novelty's personality. Basically a spider Kiriel. Adorable. We have a bit of cultural exchange with Novelty exclaiming in wonder over human tools such as glass, but there's one line in particular I can't let slide because it's, it's basically how I would describe computers. You take rocks and stuff perform complicated rituals on them and uh, turn them into these wondrous creations. Yeah, yeah, we do some pretty crazy things to rocks, I'd say. As long as y'all don't make them think. Biggest mistake you could ever do. We get some more fun characterization of the ancient Akosans and how they developed the magic system. Namely, as colonizers, they copied and or stole the magic from various peoples and creatures on the continent, adapting it to their structured magic system. Zorian is eager to learn about psychic attack slash defense and goads novelty into testing his magic mental defenses against RNA and telepathy skills. And he's crushed handily as a result. Seems no matter how good of a shell he puts up around his mind, Novelty points out the spell doesn't give him any feedback or senses for her probes. And now that she describes the cracks in his defense, it's almost like there are mistakes in the spell boundary. Something shored up by casting more perfectly. The ghost of Zvim past haunts Zorian. And he feels a chill thinking about the specter. In a completely non-random jump later, Zorian arrives for his loop-mandated suffering session with Professor Zvim. His current task was igniting thin sticks within a bundle of many without damaging any of the others than his target. But Zvim seems more annoyed at Zorian allegedly playing with a different Pyro's friend, the good old reliable 8 6 fireball. Seems his practice with Tyven is leaking out. Zvim, as always displeased with students rushing ahead with shoddy foundations, instead gives Zorian a special deck of cards with various pictures on them. His task? Burn exactly the image on the card. The twist. The cards are made with sigils that disperse mana. 
So Zorian has to quickly craft a large amount of mana, a perfect shape, and releasing it all at once. Yeah, he does not have any success. With Zvim ramping up the frequency of mentoring sessions, Zorian visits Professor Ilsa early in the loop, but this time it's to try and wheedle the teleport spell out of her. To do this, he demonstrates everything he has learned in the past two years. His shaping skills mastered, subjects he's studied, magic objects he's crafted himself, and any questions she throws at Zorian, he's prepared. If not with a perfect parry, then at least an acceptable answer. Ilsa is suitably impressed. She offers to take over mentorship from Zim, in addition to teaching him advanced illusion, alteration, animation, and conjuration. A bit of dimensionalism thrown in, if Zorian is good enough with the others. And then he'll be taught teleport. Of course, the cost to all this is he will have to sign an apprenticeship contract and take over as class representative from Ecosia. Zorian is a little bit curious at the list of disciplines, and it turns out these are all the ones that Ilsa has specialized. It seems she had an age-old dream of creating something from nothing. Unfortunately, she had a bit of an incident where a uh, gold summoning spell she made apparently took gold from a nearby antique museum and uh, conjured it from there into her hand, uh, which understandably made the museum preserving mages quite annoyed, especially since it destroyed the antique in question in the process. Ilsa is curious as to why Zorian is so dead set on learning teleport. We find out Zorian has a list of things an ideal mage can do. He can make a force field, create a magic item, produce a fireball, repair broken objects, turn invisible, and teleport. Invisibility being, of course, quite illegal. <laughs> Uh, so, Zorian is looking into outside school sources to acquire that particular ability. As the loop progresses, the RNA and Matriarch seems to appear more and more agitated to Zorian, though she never answers him when he probes. She insists about finding the third time traveler. They lay out plans for the next restart to shake things up in a big way that is impossible for the third looper to ignore. We open into the next loop, and this time it seems Zorian is bringing Kyriel with him on the train. We get some cute scenes of Zorian and Kyriel by play, which ends up being helpful as a conversation starter with someone at the arrival platform regarding little sisters. And Zorian opens with Operation Just Fucking Make Shit Up. This time, instead of spiders, he's starting rumors about the cult of the world dragon threatening to summon an army of demons on the day of the planar convergence. When he makes contact with the Aranea, he has another gift to go with the Matriarch's memory packet, a telepathic relay he has inscribed onto some discs. Turns out to have been a fool's move, as he must have accidentally signed up for an on-call list. The matriarch wakes him up in the middle of the night. Dang it, Zorian, you have got to turn your phone off when you're off shift. Or, at least in this case, you need to build an off button into your phone. You know what, Zorian? You kind of you kinda did this to yourself, buddy. Despite all the balls that it looks like are being put in the air for juggling, Zorian is still finding time for those near him. He's shopping around for supplies to teach Kyriel magic. He also finds a deck of those cards that Zvim gave him to practice on in the last loop, and for all of his complaints about Zvim's 
harsh teaching methods, he certainly cannot complain that Zvim cheaps out, as the deck of cards is quite expensive, and he opts to just try and make his own. It'll be good practice for his object crafting and spell formula mastery anyway. He also takes a minor side quest to leverage his old friend Benesek, the Loose Lipped, to further spread rumors about terrorist plots during the summer festival in Sioria. When Tyven tracks down Zorian to get the watch, Zorian goes along, although there is a different plan for this loot. The Matriarch is going to direct them to a place the invasion forces have a base so they can return to the surface with credible reports to the authorities. Pyvin and her normal party mates are quite shocked at the army gathered. And so many war trolls. The group is stumbled upon by a patrol and they barely make a fighting escape. The Zorian is internally extremely angry at the Aranea. Suspecting the matriarch may have lured the patrol into their group, as a way to cement how dangerous it is to Pyvan's party. Uh, after all, the vantage point at which the party looked at the invasion base was curiously smooth, almost as if it had been quickly carved by earth shaping. Hmm. During his chat with Spear of Resolve that evening, we learn of a further twist being introduced into this loop. Zack has been informed that the Aranea are aware of the time loop. If nothing else, there is going to be a hell of a shakeup. And that's where our chapter recap comes to an end for today. There's quite a lot of rehashing of details in these few chapters, but we are certainly building up to big events as the next two chapters will be the conclusion of the first book. So join me in a couple weeks for chapter 25 and 26 as we find out the conclusion of the first book. Will they find the third time traveler and what else is going to happen as a result?